The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The first thing I would like to tell you, which I did not mention the last time, that uh, in the reading assignment, the syllabus that we handed out, and by the way, does everybody have one? If you don't, we have some extras here. You all have one. Good. Anyway, uh, as you can see on the first page, uh, <clears throat> there is a section called um, preparatory reading. So I would recommend that if you can, to each time read this recommended reading, which is available, of course, uh, on the internet. And that will make it easier for you to uh, follow the lecture, because this course, is, both in vision and audition, uh, relies on imparting a great many facts about the workings of these two systems. And it's easier to be able to memorize these facts uh, by doing the preparatory reading if you can. All right, so today then, what we are going to do is we're going to initially start to talk about the layout of the visual system, and then we're going to talk about the retina uh, for much of the course, and at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about the lateral genicular nucleus. In each case, I will try to tell you about how some people have thought about things and what the progression is of the discoveries that have been made about the visual system. It is certainly an area of research which has been incredibly successful and has resulted in quite a number of Nobel Prizes for the discoveries that individuals had made in uncovering the workings of this system. Furthermore, many of the uncoverings that uh, investigators had done uh, came about as incredible surprises because so many of the findings were quite unexpected. And I will try uh, to point these things out during the course. And my section, as I've mentioned before, will consist of 12 lectures. And then that will be followed on uh, October 23rd by a midterm exam. And again, to, to reiterate, that's going to consist of a series of multiple choice questions. And then following that, uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, talk about the auditory system that Chris Brown is going to, going to be presenting to you. All right, so <clears throat> the first thing I want to do then is to talk about the basic wiring of the visual system, which in itself has yielded a number of unexpected surprises and also raise some interesting questions. So what I want to start with, first of all, is that when you look at some animals that have sideways looking eyes, like the rabbit and most amphibia, uh, the two eyes look out in two different directions, to the left and to the right. And that enables them to see a very large portion of the visual field. Uh, and when that is the case, as, as in, in this picture shown here for the rabbit, what you find is that there's only a small area which uh, is seen by both eyes. But then when we look at higher um, mammals, in particular primates and humans, what you find that there was a huge change in the course of evolution bringing the eyes to the front. Now, that change. Um, is very interesting, and we can ask, why on earth did that happen? Because it meant that, obviously, a human cannot see behind themselves, where these, these rabbits can see a much larger portion of the visual field. And so you sacrifice the ability to see all the way around the world uh, for being able to see with both eyes to the front. And so the question is, why did this happen? Now, we are going to discuss this in some detail, because one of the prime reasons, I believe at least, that this has happened is to be able to process information about depth 
better than it can be done by rabbits and other animals. And so when we talk about depth perception, we are going to uh, deal with this issue in more detail. Now, if you look at an animal like a rabbit, uh, what you find, and also animals which are, as I've mentioned already, uh, sorry, I'm going backwards here, uh, that you also have in fish and amphibia, you have these sideways looking eyes, and now we can ask the question, how do these two eyes make their connections through the ganglion cells to the central nervous system? Uh, and that, in fact, became, was quite an issue at one time, believe it or not, before uh, anatomical techniques became more sophisticated. Uh, and the reason it became an issue is because it was discovered uh, uh, predominantly, actually, by Cajal, who I have mentioned had received the Nobel Prize for the beautiful work he had done on not only the vi vision, but uh, in general about uh, the nervous system in 1906 with Golgi. He discovered, as did several other investigators, that the optic nerve crosses over at the so-called chiasm. And so the input from the left eye projects into the right half of the brain and from the right eye to the left half of the brain. And that became a huge issue. Why on earth would this happen? And we are going to deal with this repeatedly. It's a very interesting issue. And uh, even more interesting is the fact that when the eyes move to the front, what happened is that this kind of connection became uh, much more complicated. But before I do that, let me just say a few more words here. First of all, that in fish and amphibia, you have a huge structure called the optic tectum, which is the primary uh, visual processing center in the brain. Uh, and there is also uh, the lateral nucleus of the thalamus in these animals, but that's quite small and not very well developed. And there is a cortex in these animals, but it is, again, a primitive area compared to primates, for example. And the lateral geniculate nucleus projects to the cortex. So the left cortex in these animals gets input from the right eye, and the obvious is the case for, for the right cortex. And so consequently, this cortex sees this part of the visual field, and this cortex sees this part of the visual field. It's, it's an like, almost like an inversion. Now, we come to what happened as a result of the eyes moving to the front. When the eyes moved to the front in the course of evolution, that necessitated a major rewiring in the visual system. So that's what we are going to look at next, because that's us, all right? So what we have here then, we have the two eyes looking to the front. And imagine that these two eyes now looking at something. There's a dot here. And both eyes are looking at the same dot so that you only see a single dot. Okay. So now what happens is really something surprising. What happens is that the, let me, let me interrupt for a second and tell you that imagine that you cut your eye, I mean, don't do it, but imagine that you cut your eye vertically in half, each eye. Okay. And that means that each eye has, if you will, a nasal half and a temporal half, all right? So here we have the two eyes. Here's the left eye. And what we have is the nasal half, OK, projects across. And the same thing is true for the right eye, projects across. But now, if you look at the temporal hemiretinae, hemiretinae, remember, that's the word for it, something very interesting happens. The Temporal hemiretinae don't cross over, but they remain on the same side. So we have a color code here that the red parts project across, and the black parts also project across from one eye, but stay ipsilateral for the other eye. So you say, my god, why did this happen? What on earth is going on? And then if you study this, you realize that um, this is actually one of the few truly <coughs> logical things that you encounter when you study the brain. Many of the things you study in the brain are not, don't seem to be too logical, because in the force of, of evolution, you have to change things in very peculiar 
subtle ways to make things work. You couldn't just redo the whole system from scratch. But this is certainly a logical one, and I'll explain it to you in just a minute. OK, so now what we do next is that, uh, again, we have the two lateral geniculate nuclei. But now, these are in the thalamus. These two nuclei have grown tremendously in size and became much more important in visual processing, as did then uh, the cortex. This process, by the way, is called encephalization. So in primitive animals, you have very small cortex. And then in the course of evolution, the cortex grew and grew and grew and grew and became a more and more important structure in being able to analyze just about anything and certainly analyze vision. Now here we have a cortical area in the posterior part of the, of the brain, as I had pointed out to you the last time. And what we have is a whole series of visual areas in the cortex. Uh, most central one, I guess, would be area V1, the primary, so-called primary visual cortex, to which the lateral geniculate projects most profusely. Then we have a whole bunch of other visual areas, as we'll discuss in more detail later on. And then what happens is that we have several other uh, cortical areas. The cortex, I think you, all of you know that, is divided into four lobes, OK? The frontal, temporal, parietal, and the rear one is called the occipital lobes, all right? Now, the visual areas that you see in the back here make extensive interconnections and connections to these uh, other lobes in the brain to be able to analyze the visual scene. Now, in addition, what we have still, as we had in more primitive animals, we have a superior colliculus. Actually, two of them, one on each side. And then we have another set of areas called the terminal nuclei, the nucleus of the optic tract, about which we'll just talk a little bit um, because they are specializing in certain visual functions, but not nearly as compelling and interesting as the work that is, has been done in the cortical areas and in the superior colliculi. So this is the arrangement. But now we want to understand why do we have this strange connection here. So to understand that, uh, what we are going to talk about is the so-called horopter or the Wiesmüller circle. Now what does that? Somebody, some clever guy came up with this observation. They made a circle that goes through the nodal point of the eye, and it is, its diameter depends on where you are fixating. So fixating here, all right? And so in this case, the red area, OK, which is your left visual hemifield, impinges on the nasal retina of the left eye and the temporal retina of the other eye. So if you have an object here, all right, that hits corresponding retinal elements in the two eyes. And that is the basic rule. Anywhere along this horopter, a, a, a spot will activate corresponding regions in the two eyes. And then what happens is that those corresponding points go to the same location in the lateral genital nucleus, in the superior colliculus, and in the visual cortex. So the logic of this arrangement is to be able to have the two eyes have inputs to uh, corresponding points in the brain. That way you can see something uniform and uh, clear rather than seeing double. So that is then the arrangement that you have in primates. Now, just to anticipate a little bit, whenever images fall inside or outside the circle, they do fall on non-correspondent points. And that will have something to do, and I keep you just curious about that for the time being, about how we process depth. And that is the mechanism that is involved is, so, is called stereopsis. I've mentioned that very briefly the last time. OK, so that then um, summarizes the basic connections of the system. And then what we are going to do next is we're going to go to the retina and look at in more details about how the retina is made. And then we will go in successive steps to higher areas, sometimes going back and forth to try to understand visual processing in general. All right, so now let's begin by looking at the eye.
Now, I don't expect you to know all these names here, but you should remember, of course, the lens and the cornea. I know that already. You know the iris, right? What's the iris? OK, now what, what, what do we base, uh, base our views on the color of the eye? When you say somebody has blue eyes or somebody has brown eyes, it's based on the fact of what the coloring is of the iris. All right. Now, what's the iris? The iris uh, get, can get bigger and smaller to control the, the size of the opening into the lens. All right. It's much like uh, what you have in cameras, where they, you have the so-called f-stop, right? So if you have a large number, say f16 in a camera, that is set to 16 if you do it manually uh, when it's bright out there. But when it's dim out there, like uh, we have in this camera here, you have the lens wide open because it's pretty dark in here. Then you have a low f-stop, like an f4 or even lower, uh, to allow more light to come in, to more photons to <coughs> enter the eye. Now, Next is, here's the lens. And the, inter the fascinating thing about the lens is that in the eye, the lens is totally different from the way it is in a camera. Now, maybe by now, many of you don't even know the details about a camera. But one of the details, of course, is that to bring an image into focus, You have to adjust the distance of the lens from the film onto which the image projects. Okay, So the closer an image, the further out the lens has to go. Now, if that were the case in, in animals and humans, you would have a super bulging eye. So when you looked at something close, the eye would go out like that. And that would be really disturbing. So that, uh, <laughs> that is not the case. Because what happened instead is something very clever that um, you don't see in cameras, which is that you have this lens here, which is, um, at least in younger people, <laughs> and, uh, is, is a, an organ that can vary in thickness. Okay? So you have here some muscles, okay, the ciliary muscles, which uh, can uh, <clears throat> adjust the thickness of this lens to allow it to focus properly on the retina. Now here, the retina is going goes around, is against the inner wall of the eye, as you all know that, of course. Uh, and to explain how this is done then very, cru very, very crudely, here we have it. If you're an object really near, you want the lens to be thick to properly focus the image on the retina. And if the image is far, you have to thin the lens okay, uh, to get the proper focus on the, on the retina. So that's how the lens works, uh, at least when you're reasonably young. But then when you get older, what happens is that the uh, lens becomes progressively stiffer and stiffer. And because of that, you have to start wearing glasses. Now. In the olden days, they used to have, have lenses which came in two parts, bifocals. Okay? So if you look in the upper part, you could look in the distance. If you look in the lower part, you could look close. Nowadays, they have graduated lenses. So if you look in the upper part, you can look far. And if you want to look something, you want to look at low, down below. And then you can see that in focus. Uh, so well, once you get older, this, these lenses don't adjust as much, still a little bit. But the proof that this is not that important, thank God, now that we have these uh, uh, graded lenses and we have bifocals, is that there are a lot of people in old age who develop, and sometimes not even in old age. So in, in, in India, for example, there are a lot of young kids who have cataracts. Now, what is cataracts? Cataracts uh, interferes with the processing of vision through the lens system. It, 
uh, things become unclear because all kinds of uh, uh, blockage occur in the lens itself. So what, how is that corrected? The way that's corrected nowadays that you have what is called cataract surgery. Got it? Cataract surgery. So what they do then is they actually literally remove the lens from the eye and they put in a fixed lens made out of plastic or glass. And then, obviously, since there's no adjustment, you do have to wear glasses to look at things far away and look at things close. And most of the time, those would be sort of graduated lenses. And so people who have cataract surgery uh, can see extremely well, certainly a lot, lot better than having to de try to deal with lenses that have cataracts. All right, now there's one other point I want to make about the eye here before we move on. Maybe two points. One is that, uh, about the, this part of the eye, that you have here your so called iris, okay? And what do you call what's in the center of the iris? Pupil. pupil, very good. Now, what is the color of the pupil? In most people, it's black, right? Why is it black? How, can, how come the pupil is black? Any thoughts about that? OK, well, let me tell you. And I think what I'll do is actually I'll move on. Uh, first, I'll, I'll leave this unanswered for just a few minutes. Uh, this I've shown you before, uh, which is another amazing thing about the eye, is namely that in the fovea, you have something like 200,000 cones per square millimeter. 200,000. As you go five degrees out, it reduces tenfold to 20,000. And then you go uh, 10 degrees, it reduces by half. So because of this very high density, I've mentioned this before, uh, in the fovea, uh, you have high acuity. And that is one of the prime reasons you have to move your eye around so that you can see things in fine detail. All right, so now uh, let's take another step here and look at the retina itself. Uh, and let me first of all point out to you, I have reversed the image here to be, have it up, right side up. Uh, the light actually comes in from the bottom, goes through all, this, all these cells until it hits the photoreceptors. Here are the photoreceptors. And at the closest point to the eye, what we have is called the pigment epithelium. OK, so what's the pigment epithelium? The pigment epithelium is a single layer of cells that are pigmented to such a degree that when photons come into the eye and get to the uh, pigment epithelium, they get absorbed just like uh, a black surface that you see as a black surface uh, absorbs the photons and doesn't reflect them. So because of that, there's no reflection back out. And that explains why the pupil looks black. OK? Because the light that com com comes into the eye doesn't reflect back out. Now, there's a good reason for that, because if it were to reflect back out, it would scatter, and it would activate many more photoreceptors than it should. And because of that, you get blurred vision. Now, how do we know this? All right. Can you think of any one or any, or any species of animal where the uh, pigment epithelium is not black? OK, in cat. OK, so there are some animals you see mostly in animals that specialize in nocturnal vision that have a pigment epithelium which actually has purposefully reflecting molecules in it. OK, for, for them, this is called actually the tapetum. And uh, the purpose of that is 
to improve your ability to see so that the photons activate the photoreceptors not only in one direction, but also when they bounce back. Now, the topetum is arranged in such a way in most animals that it doesn't freely scatter the light, but scatters it in a fairly directional manner. And because of that, you can see pretty well. Now, uh, I'm sure that many of you have noticed that when you drive at night in, 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 a, in a, uh, a deserted area in the United States, which are decreasing, of course, <laughs> uh, <coughs> you can see uh, sometimes deer on the highway, or rabbits for that matter. And when you see them, it looks like they have two uh, flashlights projecting at you. It's almost scary. But it also helps you for, uh, by uh, being able to avoid hitting them. Now, that's because they have that reflecting torpedo. All right? But let's look at a different example. What other human can you think of who um, does not have a black pigment epithelium? Albino. Or for that, for that matter, some animals as well. Yes? Albinos. Very good. Albinos. Now, what's albinos? Albinos are individuals or animals uh, who lack uh, pigments in their skin and, and of course, uh, in their retina. So if you look at the eye of an albino, actually their pupil is not black. Their pupil is an Red. reddish. Very good. Why is it reddish? Because you have thousands of, uh, in, in, the, in the retina, right, right, right along, especially mostly on the outside here as well, uh, you have blood vessels. Okay? And the blood vessels, since they carry blood, uh, when light reflects from them, they will have a reddish color to them and thereby endow, if you will, the uh, pupil with a reddish color. Now, the proof that the main function of the pigment epithelium is to absorb the incoming light to prevent scattering is in the fact that albinos that lack this pigment epithelium have very poor vision. They often have vision to uh, 20 over 200 or something because the light scatters from the uh, epithelium, which is no longer pigmented in these, in these people, and activates many uh, photoreceptors, thereby reducing your ability to see things clearly and sharply. All right, so now let's Look at, go through this retina here. First of all, we have the rods and the cones. Now this is a, this brings me to a very interesting story, at least for me an interesting story. Uh, back in the um, 19th century, there was a person whose name was, uh, uh, let's see. His name was Max Schulze. I'm trying to remember when he, he lived. He lived uh, uh, from 1825 to 1874. He developed some new anatomical procedures. And as I've mentioned before, whenever new techniques emerge or invented, it's likely that you're going to make some inter interesting new discoveries. And so he was the first person by then looking at the uh, retina and looking at the photoreceptors that he said, my god, there are two different kinds of cones. I shouldn't say cones. Two different kinds of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. All right? Uh, the rods were sort of like the name implies rods, and the cones were sort of as the name implies, conish looking, OK? So he looked at that and looked at that and said, my god, why on earth would we have in most animals rods and cones? What is their function? This was a totally new discovery. And when he first published this, nobody believed him. They said, oh, they just vary randomly, and some are uh, 
more rod-like, some are more cone-like, but it's just a, the same photoreceptors. So he, of course, did not accept that. He, he saw, by being very careful about it, that it was two definitely different classes, just like it is in this picture. Uh, and so he began to ask the question, why on earth do we have this? So imagine yourself in the 19th century coming up with this incredible discovery and trying to figure out why we have them. Now, if you're a really good scientist, then you start to think analytically. And so what did he do? Oh, I'm so impressed to this day. He said, well, let me take a closer look at the retina and see how the uh, rods and the cones are distributed on the retinal surface. And he discovered, to go back to the uh, previous slide, that there is a small region here, the fovea, where there are only cones. There are no rods. And I'll show you a better picture of that in a minute. Uh, and he said, my god, if that's the case, there must be something different about the way we see in the fovea than we can see in areas where you have, you have lots of rods. So what did he discover? He discovered that. Uh, in the fovea, we don't see too well at night. Okay? And on the basis of that, he concluded that the rods are for night vision. Now, this was absolutely incredible. Uh, there's only one sad part in this story, which is that this discovery was made in, uh, in the early uh, 19th century before the Nobel Prize was initiated. Because had the Nobel Prize been initiated before he made this discovery, there's no question that he would have received the Nobel Prize for it. It's such an incredible magnitude of discovery. All right, so let's go back here then. And I pointed out the rods and the cones and the pigment epithelium. Now let's go through here. And we'll tell you about the rest of the elements, and then this time and also in several subsequent sessions, we'll talk about some of these elements in much more detail, especially about the uh, retinal ganglion cells. So anyway, when you come here to the next stage here, we have the so-called horizontal cells and bipolar cells. It's been established that the photoreceptors connect uh, with both of these, and then the bipolar cells connect into the inner portion of the retina, just as I'll show you in a minute. Now, this region here is called the OPL, and that's easy to remember, outer plexiform layer. Now then, when you get into the deeper parts of the retina, you have the so-called emocrine cells and ganglion cells. And they reside in the inner plexiform layer. Now, it is the ganglion cells that project out of the eye, and then project, as we had uh, shown you, uh, to various regions in the brain, most notably, that we're going to talk about today, the, the lateral geniculate nucleus. <coughs> now let me also point out at this stage, let me see, do I have a picture of that? Uh, point out to you some numbers. Here is an enlarged, simpl highly simplified view of rods. Now, the rods are constructed in an incredibly complex way. They have these individual so-called disks. And within each of these disks, there are about 1,000 of them. I only have 25 here, I think, or 24. There are about 1,000 of these in each rod. Okay, And within each of these disks, you have about 10,000 rhodopsin molecules. The, there are several kinds of opsins, so-called. Rhodopsins are the ones that you see in rods, then the different kinds of opsins in cones. Uh, and these are the photosensitive um, molecules in your receptors, so that when a photon comes in, and connects with and hits one of these uh, molecules, it, they change shape. 
And the simplest way of thinking about this is to say that these molecules, these rhodopsin molecules, come in two different shapes. Um, and these two different shapes are what we call, uh, <coughs> very, very simply, those, those that are uh, uh, open and those that are sort of closed, if you'll be de describing the molecular shape. And the easiest way to think of them is that they are bleached or unbleached. And so these, there are millions of these molecules. Uh, and what is that, 10 million in each eye? Yeah, sorry, in each, each rod. And you know how many rods there are in the, in the average eye? About 120 million, OK? And about 5 or 6 million cones. I mean, you're talking about unbelievable numbers. It's just hard to comprehend. But at any rate, the molecules here then are in two different uh, states, bleached and unbleached. What that means is when a molecule shifts from being unbleached to bleached as a result of a photon hitting it, um, that changes the uh, overall, and, 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 I mean, I'm talking about, of course, hundreds of molecules typically, uh, the overall degree of de and hyperpolarization of the cell. And that will then determine whether this cell is going to communicate the next elements below. And I'll, des I'll describe that in much more detail in just a minute. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how unbelievably complex this is. Yet another complexity is that you have this huge number of rods, OK? But if you think about it, would these rods be there in each, 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 uh, each sorry, in, in this in each, in, in these rods, would each of these uh, uh, disks persist for a lifetime? You know, say the average lifetime is 80 or 90 years. Uh, would these same guys uh, exist in the eye all the time? Well, the answer is no. What happens is there is yet another process, amazingly, that uh, replaces in steps uh, these disks in the rods. Um, usually a few disks every few days. So it's a constant dynamic process keeping your rods, if not your whole body, young, so to speak. All right. So anyway, this, this gives you sort of a crude sense of the complexity of this system. Uh, but now we are going to shift over and talk about the retinal ganglion cells. And then we'll come back and we we'll talk about in a bit more detail about the pre-retinal -gang, pre ganglionic elements. Here is a set of pictures created by a wonderful a scientist called Poyak, uh, showing you different classes of types, of, if you will, of retinal ganglion cells. The top row here have been named, because of their small size and the small dendritic arbors, have been named midget cells. Okay? Whereas these ones below, some of them at least, are much, much bigger and are much larger dendritic arbors, as you can see here, have been called parasol cells. And why they've been called parasol cells, I'll explain to you in just a minute. OK, now this, this, this set of pictures was created by the Golgi stain that I mentioned to you before uh, that was invented by Golgi and extensively studied uh, by Cajal. And for this incredible work they had done, a lot of it on the retina, uh, they re received the Nobel Prize in 1906. So what this disclosed then, an initial view, was that there are different classes of retinal ganglion cells. And so therefore, the big question came up, why do we have different classes of cells, like the retinal ganglion cells? What do they do? Well, initially, some people, again, which is good. I think one should be resistant to change and new ideas until they are really proved, proven well. Some people argued that I just to continue. But then it became evident that um, these are indeed different classes. And I will present some evidence to prove that. So there are actually quite a number of different classes of retinal ganglion cells that perform different jobs. 
We're going to try to understand what are the different jobs they perform. And we're going to concentrate mostly on these midget and parasol cells, because they're by far the most numerous in the retina and make a major, major contribution to orbital vision. All right, so now let's look at the physiology of retinal ganglion cells. Now that we know we have these different kinds of ganglion cells, how do we find out what they do? Well, what was recognized uh, in the early portions of the 20th century, that to find out what these cells do, one needs to study their activity. And to study their activity, what was developed after many different trials is to either record from individual axons or to use a microelectrode that you could put into the eye and record from individual cells and see what they do. Well, the first person who did this was Keffer Hartline. And for the beautiful work he had done, he received the Nobel Prize in 1967. Now, what he did, he was a tremendous surgeon. And so what he did, he did this in primitive animals like frogs. He would take the optic nerve, and he would dissect one fiber from the optic nerve, hook it up, and record electrically from it. And then what he would do, he would shine a light into the eye, move it around until the cell generated action potentials. That was just a very small region, because as I've mentioned, each cell in the retina, each ganglion cell, only sees a teeny, teeny little portion of the visual field. So that's how he did his experiments. And he made some really remarkable discoveries, which further then were elaborated by using slightly different methods. A slightly different method, first of all, was to put a microelectrode into the eye. And I've mentioned that to you before. The initial microelectrode was a very fine tube of glass, which was heated and then pulled until the tip was only about a micron in diameter, which enabled you to record from individual cells in the retina or, for that matter, anywhere in the brain. Now, another change in the methods that emerged is that uh, instead of shining light directly into the eye, we, people use reflected light. Because in, in the world, most of what we see is reflected light. We don't get, of course, nowadays it has changed a little bit because we have uh, computers and we have uh, TV, which was set up in such a way as to mimic reflected light, if you will. Okay? But for, in the natural world, for the most part, we see reflected light. All right, so when this was done, this initial work that was done by Keffer Hartline, for which he received the Nobel Prize, that he discovered uh, three major classes of cells based on, on that recording of his, which he called, first of all, on cells, secondly, off cells, and the thirdly, on off cells. Now, the on cells were those which, when you shone light into their so-called receptive field area, they would discharge vigorously. The, you turn the light on here, OK? And you can see the on cell fires. An off cell, on the other hand, fired when you turned off the light using this particular method. And on off cells were those which fired both to the onset and the termination of the light. And that's why they were called, and are still called to this day, on and off cells. So that was an incredible discovery and has created a major evolution in the study of the visual system. All right, so now uh, doing this kind of work uh, in more detail, using especially most, mostly reflected light, um, uh, several other major discoveries were made. Uh, <clears throat> A fellow at Harvard, uh, in his later years, originally at Johns Hopkins, did experiments carefully studying the receptive field structure of these cells. 
he would record, in this case with microelectrodes, from a single cell, retinal ganglion cell, and then see how it responded when you fiddled around with the light in the receptive field. So imagine then that the eye is fixed, it's looking out, you're putting an electrode into, in this case into the eye, or wherever you put it, and then you can use light, maybe like a projector, move it around to find out where the receptive field is. And then you can present either, say, a small spot of light, or you make it a big spot, make it different colors, and so on and so on. So when this was done, uh, a remarkable discovery was made by Kufler, namely that the, the so-called on and off cells were not just responding to the onset and termination of light. Instead, what they did was they responded vigorously to a small spot in the center of their so-called receptive field. But if you use a large spot like that, there was much less of a response. And that was true also for the off cells and for the on-off cells. So the surround we can think of as being inhibitory with respect to the center. And so the big question arose, why on earth did this complex arrangement evolve of having cells that have not only an excitatory center, but also have an inhibitory surround? And now I'm going to let you think about this for a minute, and eventually I will tell you as to why we have this organization. Because we are going to devote a whole session to the on and off systems, and also a complete session to the midget and parasol cells. And that's when we are going to discuss this in detail. Now, the important thing as you learn about these things is to be an active thinker. And if something comes up and say, well, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why is this? Why is that? And when you actively think about that, then it becomes interesting. And also, once the answers come, it becomes insightful and exciting to understand it. OK, so now, a series of investigators did experiments in which they, this is, sounds like a fairly simple experiment, in which they did uh, labeling of just the cell bodies in the retina and did what is called a whole mount. What's a whole mount? You take the retina, you flatten it out, and then you look at it, look at this whole layout through a microscope. <laughs> and if you label then these cells, and this, this, this was a so-called nissel stain that stains the cell bodies, but doesn't stain the, uh, uh, the processes like the dendrite or the axons. What they found was that if you did this quantitatively, they could distinguish three very distinct different classes of cells. Turned out later that there were more than three. But in this case, just doing it crudely like that, you can see those big cells, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and so on. Uh, maybe one out of seven or eight in this sample are these huge cells. And then you have some smaller cells, and then you also have some tiny cells. And if you did this quantitatively, they argued that they formed uh, distinct separate populations. They were not a continuum. All right? So then, that of course is the basic requirement to prove that indeed these are different classes of cells that probably perform different jobs. So what can you do to uh, prove this further? Well, subsequent to this kind of work, uh, people began to look at uh, another interesting question about how these retinal ganglion cells send their signals to the central nervous system. And it's been discovered not just in the retina, but in, in many other parts of the, of the, uh, of, of the uh, human and animal body, that the rapidity with which a, uh, an axon can send its action potentials down from one location to the next, from the cell body, say, to the, to the uh, axon terminals, um, is, is heavy, very much depends on the size of the cell and the size of the axon. So if you have a small cell and a very thin axon, the conduction is slower than if you have a big cell and a big axon. So if that's the case, people argued that if you were to take the 
uh, optic nerve and stimulate it at one site and a little base down, maybe back towards the retina, uh, record and see what kind of overall general, but not action potentials, but overall activation takes place. And when that was done, an amazing discovery was made. In this case, you can see we have two major dips here. This is time. Okay, here is electrical stimulation. Here's the activation of hundreds and hundreds of fibers. And it shows that they form distinct groups. A very rapidly conducting group, a slower conducting group, and a very slow, more diffuse group. So then, it was subsequently, I'll talk about that later, it was subsequently established that these very rapidly conducting uh, axons come from the so-called parasol cells. And the medium conducting ones come from the midget cells. All right? I'll tell you exactly how that was established. But now that has become a solid fact. OK, so now if you go back to the anatomy of these cell types, if you look at them at equivalent um, distances uh, of eccentricity, OK, 1, 3, and 5.7 degrees, here are examples of, of the midget cell, the endritic orbit. So again, this is a whole month. You can look straight down. At, at the cell, all right? And you can see these are very, very constricted dendritic arbors. Now, by contrast, the parasol cells have much, much larger, three times larger in diameter uh, dendritic arbors. And now I can tell you, which I deferred before, is that if you look at these, the reason they're called parasol cells is what? Because it looks like a, an umbrella, OK? So this looks like an umbrella. And of course, that's parasol. So that's why they are called parasol cells. And these guys, most of us interesting, are called midget cells because they're midget. They're small. All right, so that then established, uh, this work was done just 20 years ago. Uh, it was established that you have indeed these two very, very distinct populations of cells. So now the big question came up. Why do we have on and off cells? Why do we have midget and parasol cells? And as I say, we are going to discuss this in considerable detail. But let me just give you a crude introduction. If you look at a parasol cell, obviously because of the huge dendritic arbor, they have large, relatively, relatively speaking, large, much larger receptive fields, three times bigger than midget cells. The midget cells are so specific that each cell in central retina, it's input for the excitatory center from just one single cone. Now, what does that mean? What I didn't emphasize before, but I'm sure you all know, that we have three major classes of cones, which some people call red, green, and blue. And then when you say that, uh, the real aficionados say, oh, come on, you can't say that. Uh, you're supposed to say short, medium, and long wavelength wavelength sensitive neurons. But we'll just call them red, green, and blue. Now, the reason then is that the center of one class of midget cells gets input only from red cones, another from green cones, and some from blue cones. I'll show that in more detail in a minute. So we have these three sub subtypes. And so therefore, we can say that the midget cells, because they're so teeny, they should be able to see fine detail. And because of this, wiring, they should be able to tell you about color. By contrast, if you look at the parasol cells, they get a mix of inputs, both in the center and the surround. So it's unlikely that they can tell you about color. And we'll examine that in much more detail soon. All right, so now the other interesting thing about this system is that it makes you speculate as to why we have them. And we'll elaborate on that is at the midget system, when you turn on the light, when you shine a small spot in the center of the receptive field, gives you a fairly sustained response for the brief time that was on, maybe a, a second or two, OK? But the parasol system gives you only a burst, like that, instead of, of a sustained response. So think about that. Say, why would we have two systems which are not only different in size, but also different in the profile of their responses?
And then, once you have this question in your mind, then you will be eager to find out when we talk about that time after next. OK, so now let's go back to the beginning here and talk about the photoreceptors in just a bit more detail, uh, um, just so you can get a better picture of it. Here, as I've mentioned to you before, in the fovea, you have very, very tightly packed uh, cone photoreceptors. They're almost hexagonal in shape rather than round. They're so tightly packed. But then when you go five degrees out, you first of all see that the uh, cones got to be much larger. And now you have an intermixture of rods there that you can see. Uh, so in this region, you can process both information at low illumination levels and high illumination levels, whereas here, as uh, Kaffir Hotline had proven, uh, you can only see under fairly bright normal illumination conditions. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so now, if you go even further out in the retina, this is a beautiful three-dimensional looking picture. This shows the rods and the cones in the periphery. And many, many more rods per unit area. And the cones have gotten even bigger. And so obviously, the ability to, for the cones to process fine information has uh, been degraded as a result. Now again, as I've mentioned to you before, we have in humans, there are about 100 million, 120 million rods and about 5 million cones in each retina. OK, so now, if you look at the overall distribution, this is not too important, you can see that as you go away from the fovea, there's a very rapid decline in the number of cones. That's a, that, that's a hash line. And then there are no rods in the fovea, but they increase rapidly, and then they fall off. So that's the sort of the overall distribution. And therefore, you can see fine detail in the center. And you're very sensitive uh, uh, at, in, for night vision, uh, not in the far periphery, but sort of in the, in the mid, mid uh, section here, anywhere between 20 and, and 40 degrees uh, from the uh, fovea. Now let me remind you, because I'm sure you know all this already, a few facts. Okay. <clears throat> Some of this, I will just write down a couple of these things. First of all, uh, what is a degree of visual angle? That's a good question. Uh, what does it mean on the, on the retinal surface? Just let me give you an inter interesting mnemonic. If you stick out your arm at, like that and you look at your thumbnail, that imprints one degree of visual angle on the retinal surface. OK? Now we are going to talk a lot about very small measurements. And so when we talk about small measurement, I mentioned already that the tip of a microelectrode is about one micron. Now what is a micron? Anybody know? Yes? 10 to the negative 6. OK. Uh, one micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. OK? Now, Talking about that in terms of millimeters, which you're going to do a lot, that's a, the greatest convention. We need to also know what is the relationship uh, between inches and millimeters or centimeters. OK, so if you take one inch, we all know what an inch is, I guess. Roughly, if you look at your thumbnail again, it's maybe a little bit under an inch, OK? Now, one inch equals 2.54 millimeters, OK? So that's, an, that's a very interesting mnemonic to remember. So whenever you look at various things and try to understand size, uh, once you, you may need to make that conversion, uh, if, especially if you uh, have always thought about things in terms of uh, Inches, yes. I think you meant to write centimeters. What? Uh, did you mean to write centimeters? You're right. 2.5 uh, 
centimeters. Yeah, 254 millimeters. <laughs> You're right. OK, sorry about that. Very good. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, so now uh, what we are going to do next is we're going to move on. And I'll tell you another clever experiment that had, that had been done. These people here, McCrane and all, uh, developed a method which enabled them to selectively label the blue cells in the retina. And this shows a picture of that. All the rest of them are red and green cells. Okay? So only one out of eight um, cones, sorry, uh, one, uh, yeah, one out of eight cones uh, is in the fovi foveal area, near foveal area, I should say. This is both the fovea and the per perifovea, is uh, black. The rest of them are red and green cones. Okay? Now, let's become specific about the facts here and tell you, first of all, that one degree, roughly one degree, okay, which I pointed out is like a thumb, it comprises 200 micra on the retinal surface. Uh, the intercone distance in the fovea is only 2.4 micra, okay? Whereas when you, uh, well, and it, 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 per square, square millimeter, I already mentioned this, you have about 200 thousand cones. You go out five degrees, that reduces tenfold. You go, and then, uh, this I already pointed out to you several times. That's a good thing to remember. And one thing I haven't mentioned before is that if you look at a 12 font letter, I, uh, and you look at it at, at 23 centimeters, uh, that activates about 80 cones. So that gives you sort of a handle on what is the nature of activation there. And I already said that several times, namely that each rod has a thousand disks, and each disk ha in it has ten thousand molecules. Okay, and as I've just mentioned, one out of eight cones is blue; the others are fairly equal in number, but varies from person to person. Okay, so now uh, we are going to tell you about yet another experiment. And in this, this is an incredibly clever experiment that was carried out by Ursula Drager. And at that time, when she did this beautiful experiment, she did this at Harvard, at the Harvard Medical School. And what she did was this. She took the words fiat lux, put it uh, on a screen, and exposed it, that to a dark adapted animal, and the animal being a mouse, OK? And then her procedure enabled her to label, using a, a monoclonal antibody label, those cells that had been activated by fiat lux, OK? So this is then what she, this is, this is the actual retina, flat mount retina, showing you what had been activated. Now that's remarkable, beautiful, and she, came and gave a talk here at MIT maybe about 15 years ago. And when she presented this picture, one of the students, it wasn't any of you, I guess, uh, uh, raised her hand and was very upset. And so Ursula said, yes. So what do you think this patient, this, this subject asked? This listener asked. Well, this was a very active thinker. This person said, but, 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 was, was this image right set up on the retinal surface? That was a question. And Ursula Drager said, no, it was upside down. I just rotated it 180 degrees so you can see it. All right? Well, interestingly enough, there were times when this became an issue. First of all, before people knew about lenses and that lenses turn images upside down. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, because many people didn't believe that the images were upside down on the retina. 
I mean, if images are upside down on the retina, they're upside down on, the, in, in, on your brain, and yet the world is right side up. How, what, what's going on? So I would say about eight or 10 years ago, uh, I was asked to um, review a paper for a high visibility journal. I, sh I can't name the journal. Uh, in which the investigator very, very vociferously proclaimed that we have all been wrong and that the images are right side up on the retina after all. So what was his proof? Well, his proof was that uh, he took an ox eye, a slaughtered ox's eye, and cut out a little piece in the back of the eye and put a translucent piece of paper over it and then presented a stimulus out there. And when you looked at the back of the eye, uh, at the translucent part, the image was right side up. A little bit blur blurred, but right side up. And so he felt that, that he proved that images are right side up on the retina after all. Well, I was flabbergasted. And it took me quite a while to figure out why this guy got what he got, because he'd obviously got what he got. So can you guys think of any reason for this? How come he got what he got? Wait, what did he do? He took the eye, okay, and in the back he cut out a little opening and put a trans transparency over it. So then anything came in there, you could see what, what, what uh, would have been normally at, on the retinal surface. I mean, it was a clever experiment, no question about that. So but what was wrong with the experiment? Well, I'll tell you. What was wrong with the experiment goes back to what I told you before about the way the uh, lens works, right? The lens works so that when you look at something close, the muscles of the lens are such that it makes the lens fat. And when the muscles relax, it makes, sorry, yeah, relax, it makes the lens thick. Th sorry, thin, OK? So that means, just to be graphic about it, is that if you have a thick lens, you have a, a short uh, focal length. And if you have a thin lens, you have a much longer focal length, like that. OK? So now, if you look at the uh, the back of the eye here, where the photoreceptors are, in this case, it looks like it's with the upside down. But if they were in the same distance here, it would be blurred and it would remain light, right side up, just like it is with a magnifying glass. Okay? So what this guy didn't know is the rule of how you know, the muscle works in the eye to control the lens. And when the animal was, was killed, uh, it, it no longer had the lens at the proper focal level, depth. Okay, and therefore the image was right side up. So therefore, guess what happened? I uh, wrote back to this high visibility journal saying that this guy is, is wrong for this reason. Okay, <laughs> so that was certainly an interesting experience and that's why I uh, managed to learn a little bit about how the lens works in the eye, which is a remarkable way it works, since it's so totally different from what we are familiar with um, when it comes to cameras. OK, so now let's go to the next step, uh, one down from your, uh, from your uh, photoreceptors, and we come to the so-called bipolar cells. Here's a series of pictures of the so-called cat bipolar cells. And what was discovered is that the bipolar cells, here they, in the outer plexiform layer, they connect with the photoreceptors. And the inner plexiform layer, their axonal projections are such that in the upper layer here, which is IPL layer A, the cells there are off cells. And the ones that project below this here are the so-called on cells. So there's a separation of the so-called on and off cells. 
at the bipolar cell level in the manner in which they connect. And so therefore, those ganglion cells that connect with these are off ganglion cells, and those that project with, connect with these are uh, on ganglion cells. All right, so that's the, basically out of the bipolar cells. And then when you come to the horizontal cells, here's an example of a beautiful example of a Prussian yellow labeled uh, horizontal cell. And if that is then analyzed in detail, uh, it looks something like this. This particular cell it has uh, 14, no, 15 connections, okay, with uh, the photoreceptors. And these cells, I can I might as well anticipate, we'll talk about that in more detail later, they make play a central role in providing the surround inhibition that I described to you for those retinal ganglion cells. Then if we proceed to the emocrine cells, and again, things are so complicated, the numerous, numerous emocrine cells, different types, and they have been studied extensively. There are more than 20. Uh, and here's a clever experiment I thought I'd point out to you. What you can do here, if you look at the so-called cholinergic emocrine cells, that's one class, uh, you can selectively label them because they're cholinergic. And here's an example of what the, all those lighter blue ones are, are your cholinergic cells. And then what you can do, you can put this under a microscope, and then you can lower a microelectrode into one of these cells, just like I've done here. And if you look at this closely, this is not the best of pictures. This is the labeled, again, Prosen yellow labeled cell, endocrine cell. You can see it has all these processes. So then, if you look at this on the microscope under high quality, you can uh, uh, draw these out. And this is what they look like, OK? So this is a cholinergic cell. And uh, this is another type, which is called A2, which has a lot to do with um, uh, rods. And then we have another class called open immunergic. I'm not going to go into detail about it. But you can see that each of these now, scientific methods enabled you to specify what these emocrine cells are like. And on the basis of that, people have come up with ideas what the emocrine system does. OK, now we come to the crux of things in the last few minutes. We're going to talk about the electrical responses in the retina. Now, this is going to be, again, fairly complicated. And this work, again, remarkable work, which, in my view, merits a Nobel Prize, uh, but it has not yet been awarded, uh, to uh, John Dowling at Harvard. Uh, and let me just introduce this by telling you how they went about this experiment. They realize that the cells in the retina are very, very small. And so it's very difficult to record from them intracellularly. You have to do that if you want to be able to label them anatomically. And so they looked around for a species of animal that uh, had large cells in the retina. And they discovered after a lot of search that the so-called mud puppy, and the Nectarus maculosus, uh, is, a, is an animal that has unusually large retinal ganglion cells. Then they developed the technique of removing the eye from, from this animal and putting it into a dish, because that makes it real stable. And then they were able to put an electrode in there, define what the cells did functionally, by shining light on and looking at, looking at their activity. And then uh, they were able to label the cell by injecting a labeling substance. So that's what they did. And so here is the description of that arrangement. Here you have an inverted mud puppy retina. And here you have a DC recording electrode. And what you do then, you look at an oscilloscope. And at this point, the cell uh, is entered by the uh, DC recording. And then once it's inside, cells inside are negatively charged with respect to the uh, surround, uh, usually up to about 70 millivolts. In this case, I have 50 millivolts labeled. And so once you're inside the cell, you see a sudden drop to, to a minus level. And then if the cell discharges an action potential, then you uh, <coughs> see that, of course, in the oscilloscope. 
And then you can study this cell in all kinds of detail as to how it responds, what it responds, and so on, to determine what its characteristics are. So then, when they did that, they made the following central discoveries. They discovered, first of all, that receptors all hyperpolarize to light. Now, this is the opposite of what you would have thought. Uh, <clears throat> because the principle of the way cells operate, and I'm sure you know all this, but I will also describe it in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, cells, when they hyperpolarize, <laughs> okay, they are less likely to cause a release in neurotransmitters. If they depolarize, they will increase the likelihood of, of, uh, action, uh, of uh, uh, neurotransmitters being released. And by the way, the neurotransmitter for these receptors is glutamate. And all, also, uh, which I should emphasize here, is that the receptors never give action potentials. They only give <coughs> graded potentials. And that's also true for the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells. Now, they found that all receptors hyperpolarize to light, meaning that they <coughs> activate subsequent elements in the retina when it gets darker out there rather than when it gets lighter, which is the opposite that we all would have expected. Uh, <coughs> same thing for the horizontal cells. But then when you come to bipolar cells, suddenly you find that there are two different classes. One class which mimics what the receptors do, the other class that does the opposite. Okay? And so the bipolar cells of these two types, this type has sign called sign conserving synapses, and this type has sign inverting synapses. <coughs> now, amacrine cells come in, in various types, and some give action potentials, and ganglion cells all give action potentials. So to go through this again, all receptors hyperpolarize the light, horizontal cells all hyperpolarize the light, about half uh, bipolar cells hyperpolarize and half depolarize. Now this is accomplished, by the way, I'll go into that in more detail later, by virtue of having uh, different kinds of neurotransmitter receptor sites. And I'll talk about that in a lot of detail when you talk about the on and off cells. Okay, and then we have the amacrine cells, some hyperpolarize, some depolarize, and some give action potentials, and all ganglion cells give action potentials. So that is a major, major discovery, and not only major, but totally unexpected from what one would have thought. All right, so now let me just explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, if you go inside a cell, okay, then if you, the cell is activated, it can be either get a, what you see is an excitatory postsynaptic potential, which goes from minus towards plus, or you can get an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And this discovery was made by Eccles, which was a remarkable discovery for which he received the Nobel Prize uh, some years back. All right, so now if we look at those cells which, have, which give action potentials, what happens is when you get an EPSP, that's why it's called excitatory postsynaptic potential, uh, then you increase the likelihood that an action potential is going to be generated that will send its signal down the axon to the next uh, location of the cells. All right, so that's the basic process. Uh, so again, to reiterate, photoreceptors hyperpolarize the light. Uh, therefore, glutamate is released when there is a decrease in illumination, the opposite of what anyone would have expected. All right, so that, I think, uh, brings us to what I wanted to cover today. I'll wait until next time to talk about the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is very brief. But let me go through the photoreceptor basics again. All photoreceptors hyperpolarize to light. Depolarization of the photoreceptor releases glutamate. Photon absorption by the photopigment results in isomerization of the chromophore from 11 cis to 11 trans. This is what I told you to think about in a very simple fashion to say that, they are, uh, that, that, that the uh, 
photoreceptor molecules, rhodopsin in this case, um, either is bleached or unbleached. Okay? So once it's bleached, further light has no effect on it. And at any point, given whatever the level of illumination is, a certain percentage of, of, the, of these rhodopsin molecules are bleached, and a certain percentage is unbleached. The darker it is, the more are unbleached. All right. Then we have these two classes that we talked about, the on and the off cells, that we will discuss in some detail. Uh, the synaptic junction of bipolars is sign conserving, as I had just said, and that of the on bipolars is sign inverting. Now, the on bipolar receptor is, I should mention that now, and I will deal, deal with it in detail, uh, is called the m glu r 6 Its activation leads to closing of channels call, causing hyperpolarization. So that's the basic layout then of the photoreceptors. And um, I will now stop at this point, And next time, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, lateral genital nucleus. And then we're going to move on to talk about the cortex. And then if you look at your uh, uh, assignment sheet, as you can see here that on September 16th, we're going to talk about the on and off channels. And then we'll deal in more detail with these really rather complex things, which are pretty hard to remember, about hyperpolarization, depolarization, glutamate, uh, glutamate uh, receptor sites, and so on. Okay? Thank you.